Um, the next presenter in the session is Jeff Grant. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeff. Um, he, in, in partnership with Julia, farms sheep, beef and deer uh, at properties in Belfer. Together they are part owners of Northern Southland Vets. Such a long CV, I, I just don't know how to, how to abbreviate it. He's been an MP for two terms, he's been a director of more than 25 organisations, um, including AgriSearch, where he was chair for a time. Uh, he's currently director of Great South and chair of Thriving Southland. Jeff. Thanks very much, Warren, and thank you, firstly, for the invitation to the conference. And Laurie, uh, it's lovely to catch up. It, it does worry me a little bit about this recycling of... Uh, I'm 64 years of age, and I just sort of think sometimes we should retire rather than keep coming back. But it's good to see you, Laurie, and uh, thank you for those who are able to make it to Southland. This is normal weather. Uh, the expectation for us at this time of the year is the grass grows. Uh, I don't think I've seen so much baleage and silage made in Southland for probably the last 20 years, uh, so it's an exceptional piece. I'm just going to grab a glass. Thanks, Warren. Uh, look, can I just firstly uh, start by saying um, I'm a reasonably pragmatic person, so I'm not going to talk to you about taking you on a journey or the circle of life, but I have taken up a word that I don't normally like either called reflection. Uh, having the opportunity to write a paper after Dean approached me to come to your conference uh, 14 months ago and then reading it again on Thursday, I thought, seriously, was I really going to say that? Uh, and I just thought in terms of where we've come uh, through post-COVID, it was really interesting to see uh, just how much the world changes in a 12-month period. I don't think any of us expected a war. I don't think any of us thought that COVID would go for so long. And so for that reason, in terms of the topic today, uh, the future of farming uh, in regard to Southland is quite an important issue because this province relies more on agriculture than any other aspect of its economy. It is the largest employer, it is the largest by GDP, and obviously in terms of the diversity now that we have in agriculture, uh, many people don't realise we now grow between four and 500 hectares of tulips and lilies, of which about 40% get exported to Holland. Uh, so the diversity of the economy is something that has been significant over the last two decades, but is also, in my view, about to face a period of change once again. I'm just going, I'm technically phobic, and I wanted to just acknowledge my wife uh, always suffers from this panic when I say I'll speak at a conference because she helps me with the PowerPoint, uh, and on the basis I always never sure what's going to come up on the screen. <laughs> there were three versions. I was pleased to arrive and find that the version I thought I was speaking on was the version we have. Look, I'm going to talk briefly about the past, the, the next challenge, a little about a thriving Southland and what we're trying to do in terms of that challenge, environment, sustainability, and the regulator versus the consumer, and also the risk and opportunities. If we look at the past, uh, I've, uh, I was 14 in the late 70s uh, when uh, we saw the end of what we would have seen, the skinny sheep policy. This was the development of uh, incentives to farming, which piled on fertiliser, saw the dramatic increase in terms of the number of stock units in New Zealand, predominantly in the sheep industry, and farmers went hell for leather, and then somebody sort of realised there wasn't a market for it all. And then we went into the mid-80s, which was the removal of the subsidies. I spent my first year farming uh, in partnership uh, of the year ending in subsidies and couldn't understand how farmers didn't make money. And then realised when my mortgage went to 17.5% and my current account went to 24, this got a bit tougher. Uh, and on that basis, also the share market crash in 1987. Agriculture again went through the same problems in starting in the late 90s uh, where the markets started to improve but the access to markets continued to be difficult and then we suffered from the 2007-2008 global financial crisis which put pressure on prices and threw 
till about 2012. And then obviously we're in this next period which is post-COVID and also now the economic instability that now will ramp in front of us. It's interesting on in these occasions, you always something that triggers your mind and reminds you of those. In 1987, I always remember getting out of a taxi, as many would have learnt, uh, in Wellington on the trip that only used to take 20 minutes from the airport into the CBD, uh, and the taxi driver spending 20 minutes telling me what I should invest in the share market. And somebody telling me some years later, when taxi drivers start to advise you about your economic investments, it's time to get out. I didn't take the lesson. I was heavily investing in the share market at the time, in Robert Jones, Chase and others. And the same in uh, the 90s, uh, sorry, in the 80s in terms of, and then in 2008, on the global financial crisis when people talked well beforehand about junk bonds and prime uh, sub mortgages and nobody really understood what that impact was until the Lehman Brothers dropped off. I got the first indications of an economic instability in the weekend when two of my millennial daughters arrived. We had all the family home for the weekend at the farm and they turned up with clear skin Pinot Noir and clear skin uh, Pinot Gris at $7.99 a bottle. I said to them, what's going on? They said, do you not realise our mortgages are going up? It's getting tougher. So in terms of the challenge, I think one of the problems that on the ground in terms of agriculture at the moment is to actually see what the pathway forward is, and this is all around environmental sustainability. So at a national level, we have uh, these four major changes in terms of uh, policy development, either in place or in train. And then on top of these, a range of regulations which have caused farmers to become somewhat confused as to what are the capacity and their ability to adjust to the market, but more importantly to deal with climate change as we know it. I have to say in terms of that, that pathway is still somewhat confused and while on the ground my sense is that a majority of farmers are actually keen to move, we are now in what is known as stranded capital. And this is a term used where there is a level of encouragement to invest, but not sure what to invest in. And while the riparian, right, uh, riparian ways in terms of waterways has been extremely successful and farmers would recognise the benefits both to the waterway and also to their properties, whether to invest in trees at 30 metres apart, whether they should be natives, pines, whether it should be into the ETS, whether it will be seen as a credit and whatever falls out of Ekanoa, uh, is still a confusion in terms of that investment. My impression is farmers are prepared to invest in terms of their climate mitigation issues, but are not sure where that total investment should take place. And so for that reason, Thriving Southland, which I have the privilege of being the chair, has been involved in a process here in Southland to try and give some direction, some ability for farmers to understand what are those opportunities. Community groups were established back probably 10 or 15 years ago uh, in Southland. They started to be encouraged by local involvement and we saw the development of what then became catchment groups. It's interesting, I noted in the paper I wrote, I think I said there were 29, there are now 35 catchment groups. I said there were 1,000 farmers involved, there are now 1,300 farmers involved. Considering there are approximately about 3,500 farmers that are what you would term uh, commercially involved in agriculture in Southland. And uh, we have about 2,500 people now on our database. This is a ground up mechanism and is very driven by the ability to do that in the way that those uh, are on the ground operate on. Thriving Southland as an organisation is the facilitator uh, and so those catchment groups are involved in a whole range of things throughout the area. We started in land and water, uh, we have moved into climate change and some of the work, especially the project work we're doing and we're also now looking at biodiversity because you cannot treat each of these in silos while I look at the ministries in my view treat these in silos in terms of what they're doing. 
Can I, just because I've now noted this is being recorded, uh, some of the views expressed will be my own, and some will be as the Chair of Thriving Southland. I'll let you decipher which of those you want to take. Uh, but look, uh, we have now got five catchment coordinators, coordinators on the ground. Uh, we're working through a period uh, over the next few years where we won't be relying on MPI funding. Uh, we look to them for the core funding, but we have started in the last 12 months to reach out to funding in other areas. I'm going to talk about a couple of projects. These are the two larger ones. Uh, so we have uh, four main catchments uh, that we work in and about 90% of the productive area in Southland. This is the Aparima one. It's made up of six catchment groups and it is called the ACE program. Uh, the program is developed around the full catchment and the idea is that while farmers and communities work within their own small areas or tributaries to rivers, eventually the outcome has to be about the whole of the catchment rather than just the parts of it. This has been very successful uh, in terms of the development because we have uh, engagement from commercial companies, banks, uh, the industry good organisations through to Environment Southland as well, collectively involved. Initially the project started out with four main aims. Uh, and in those first three were logical things that were done. It, isn't, it is interesting that the stream walks that take place in the Aparima program bring up the largest number of people both in the community and farmers. Uh, the fascination about what's in rivers and streams is becoming the biggest player in terms of the interests of the groups. We have also now developed in this program on this catchment around farm environment plans winter practices and efficient nutrient use. These are some of the other programs. As I said at the start, they're ground up, so they are driven from within the catchment groups rather than from thriving Southland itself. The second pro program uh, is some that's funded by Agmart, predominantly, uh, along with a couple of others. And this is the work that we've been developing, building on some earlier work done on landscape DNA uh, funded by Department of Conservation and Fonterra. Can I just make a bit of a plea? Uh, my impression has been over the last couple of years as I've been involved in this area is that there's a lot of funding going into policy, public policy, there's a lot of funding going into regulation and there's a lot of funding going into what we would term pure science over some years now about climate change and environmental impact in terms of sustainability bugger all on applied. And that's the frustration is that farmers when they're looking for techniques and tools are somewhat struggling to find an identifiable way of doing the work on their farms. Hence the reason we got into this program. This is now, at, we're spending about $600,000. Uh, we're looking at future funding in terms of this and it is predominantly driven by land and water science here in Invercargill under Dr Clint Risman. Uh, we got initial funding and we're doing the whole of the Matara catchment uh, and on the basis of that we're using temporal data. So those that know physiographic work that was done uh, some years ago, especially in the US, this is the predominantly the basis of what we're doing. The, the platform now sits with 32 different databases in order to provide the information and the footprint of a property down to a paddock level. We're only 12 months into the program in terms of the, the development. This is a 700 hectare property in northern Southland. And to give you an example, this is on one layer, nitrous oxide, which is a problem in the Wyndham uh, catchment area. What this shows you in the red areas is where nitrous oxide, in the terms of what the topsoil does, uh, is a high prone risk and in the blue is the lowest uh, end in terms of the risk that you have in terms of nitrous oxide. This gives the initial platform for a farmer to make some decisions about the landscape of his property and what they can do with it. This is the lovely farmer's version. So the family, when looking at all the data and being provided an explanation around the basis of it, has now started to work on their environmental plan which in my view has an impact on that property which may be different to the property on the flat or a property further up in the hills. 
My apologies because farmers do do things differently and the handwriting's on the other way around, uh, but the sense of what they're trying to do. So what they've identified on the far end of the property is steep uh, facing country that was classically developed by his father and now taking the view that this is not productive uh, and to the extent that it would be looked at as being some of the mitigation factors in terms of looking at their uh, ability to get to zero. Uh, the areas that are highlighted uh, in the lime green are the areas that would be proposed as wetlands. These have been strategically looked at in terms of the streams and the tributaries on the property and on the basis of saying these would become similar to sediment traps. Uh, the works that's been done here in South and is identified, we would need to get to about 5% of all land in wetlands uh, in order to meet uh, carbon zero by 2050. And in terms of some of the other areas is a look at regeneration or else uh, return to forestry. This program, uh, as I said, is while some of the work's been done over the last 20 or 30 years, the development in terms of to a tool uh, that farmers would be readily able to build as part of their farm environmental plan uh, has got some way to go. Our ambition is to be there by year three, uh, and as I said, we're in year one now. To give you an example, though, we did a radiographic uh, of about 180 hectares uh, at our home property recently as part of 1,800 hectares identified as high nitrate area in Balfour. And on the basis of the information from that and changing the way we do soil testing on our property, we have reduced the actual fertiliser put on our property by 30% this year. And on that basis, we we're able to move quite quickly uh, in terms of identifying benefits from these programs. I'm just going to go through the aspect of where I see the environmental sustainability in terms of being a market export winner. Uh, look, the millennials are writing the script on the Gen Z are uh, pushing the delivery. This is a trend internationally uh, and we need to respond. I said often that the regulator is um, at risk of stopping innovation and compliance and it is important that they are hand in hand with the exporter and the producer in terms of where we go. My view is that the consumer is driving the demand and on that basis we'll be ahead of the regulator as we move in the next few years. We are seeing this by the demands by international companies and what their expectations are of exporters in New Zealand. There is this risk that if we don't align the regulation and the public policy with the outcomes that we need to get in a way that farmers and the wider industry can move, we are at risk of getting this wrong. But the opportunity is vast. In my view, it's not about whether uh, we can do it, is that my view in New Zealand, we are probably the ones that, that are gonna lead the market end of this uh, on an international basis, and our ability to do that uh, is with the science and technology rather than the regulation. These are the sort of companies that are now making demands uh, on the basis of this, I must say when I put KFC in there, uh, my wife was unsure that that was the case. Uh, but the reality is that these companies are now making increasing demands. Uh, grinder Beef, as an example from McDonald's, are now looking at the sustainability footprint that they are seeing right back to the farm, and this demand will come increasingly over the next few years. Look, the last bit I just wanted to talk about was uh, disruptive technology. Uh, in my view, the part that we're still not really understanding is the ability for disruptive technology uh, to change the way the consumer sees us and the ability to get that information very quickly. And that uh, started some years ago when we used to look at what was known as the footprint of an animal. In Japan, supermarket was being able to trace back to the farm. This is an increasingly come where there are no needs for an intermediary for a consumer to find out that information. And that ability to change is quite significant. The other is supermarkets. The way people buy food is dramatically changing. If you go to just out of London now, the largest supplier of on to the household is providing that uh, stuff through a 
a warehouse that's the size of four football fields of which there are no humans packaging any of the food. So the footprint is completely changing in the way it goes. And the last thing I was just going to say, my sense is that alternative proteins are the next challenge for us, and my view is if we get the sustainability part right, uh, that challenge will be less over the next decade than perceived by those who too tend to use plant as the next alternative uh, in terms of protein going forward. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Jeff. Gee, there's an awful lot in there, and I hope that you'll be around long enough for people to ask hard questions of you.